Hey there. In this video, I'm going to be going over 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 20. Speaking of the gift of tongues and the interpretation of tongues. And while, while this chapter does talk a lot about uh, an unknown tongue, the emphasis is more on the interpretation of tongues and the edification of the church. And as you can see in the first verse, it also mentions prophecy and also in a few other verses. And for sake of time, I'm not going to be uh, talking about the, uh, the gift of prophecy. Um, uh, I'm sure this video is going to be long enough just going through these 20 verses talking about the unknown tongues and interpretation. So, um, I plan on doing a, a part 2 of this going through verses 21 through 40. And in this video I'm just going to go over verses 1 through 20. So perhaps I'll do a second part. Uh, but I don't know when that will be. Because as you'll see I'm just going to make my point in this video. So first off, let me just point out. Because I'm going to run a few references. But I just want to start out in Romans and uh, give you this in uh, verse 11, Romans 1, 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end, you may be established. That's all the way back in Romans 1. And finally, in uh, Romans 12, he really gets into detail of what these uh, gifts are. And gives a good explanation of how it resembles uh, the body of Christ, as well as uh, 1 Corinthians 12, does the same thing. But uh, here in Romans 12, 4, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, this one body is the body of Christ, as it says in verse 5, So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, with a prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. So, gifts differing according. So we have different gifts. We are mem many members in one body, having differing, having gifts differing. That's all I'll say about that. And let's jump to Romans, or excuse me, First Corinthians twelve, uh, verse four. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And I'll just run through this. Differences of administrations, diversities of operations, uh, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom to another, and again it repeats this over and over. There's a good emphasis on this. To another, 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 to another. Now, you got to get that right. It does not say to all, it says to another. Because we are one in the body of Christ, and we are many members in the body of Christ. And Paul even gives this illustration. In uh, verse 15, if the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. See, this is giving the illustration of a body. Some people are a foot, some people are a hand in the body of Christ. So we are different members in the body of Christ. We're different members in one body, so also we have different gifts by the same Spirit. Not everyone has the same gift, and not everyone is the same member of the body. So, that's all I'll say about that. So, uh, I'll read verse 1. For all after charity, and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. And again, um, while I'm in 1 Corinthians 12, I'll just mention, but covet earnestly the best gifts, yet I show unto you the more excellent way. The more excellent way is charity, as it says in chapter 13. It's the charity chapter. And so if you have the best gifts, because there are best gifts, some gifts are better than others, so you can covet earnestly the best gifts, yet show I unto you the more excellent way, 
just charity. So even if you have the best gifts and you don't have charity, the gift is essentially useless. And I believe the best gifts are mentioned in chapter 13 and verse 8 specifically, prophecies, tongues, and uh, knowledge. So, um, and uh, prophecy, I believe, is the best gift. Wherefore, brethren, verse 39, covet to prophesy. Covet the best gifts, covet to prophesy. I believe that's the best gift. As well as uh, the other ones mentioned in uh, uh, chapter 13. Verse 2, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. An unknown tongue is a language unknown or not understood by the church. It's a natural foreign language of a man from another country. Uh, this verse, verse number two, is prayer. He speaks to God, not men, because none interprets. Okay, there's no interpretation mentioned in this verse because there's no interpretation needed because he's talking to God. He speaks not unto men, but unto God. And yes, a tongue is just another word for language. If you go back to Genesis 10 and uh, Genesis 11 with the Tower of Babel, it's when the first time the word tongue is used and it's defined as a language. Of course, God scatters all the uh, scatters everyone at the Tower of Babel to different languages, different tongues. Then go to Acts 2 where they again speak in tongues, but it's defined as a language in the next few verses. And the languages are listed in verses uh, 9 through 11, Acts 2, 9 through 11. So this is prayer, verse number 2. And it says, No man understandeth him. Not that he himself doesn't understand what he's saying. It doesn't say that. He understands what he's saying. It says, No man understandeth him. Alright? So I just have to point that out, because the charismatics get that confused. Um... No man understandeth him. He himself understands. The text says, No man understands him. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now I'm going to get back to the mysteries at the end of this study, and you'll see why. I'm going to sort of build up to that. Again, that's something else that the uh, Charismatics get confused on. They don't uh, know what the mysteries are or um, what this really means. Um, Verse he, verse three. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. But he that prophesieth edifieth the church. So this is what um, prophecy is for. It speaks unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. And he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, because no man understandeth him. He edifies himself. See, that's another reason why he understands what he's saying, because it edifieth himself. He understands what he's saying, but no man understandeth him. <clears throat> that's why he does not edify others. He that prophesieth edifieth the church. Because using this prophecy, for example, they're speaking in a known tongue. They understand what they're saying. See, this is a, a church setting that it's really speaking of. There is a dominant language in the church. Um, see, we're kind of far removed from that today in 2017 America, sort of. You know, with church buildings and all that, I mean, there's some problems there, but we're mainly an English church. And so there would be a dominant language in the church, and just like today, really, sometimes you get... Uh, you know, missionaries, or, you know, wherever the case may be. You get someone that speaks in an unknown tongue. And they need an interpretation. If not, they only edify themselves. So, prophesying, speaking this, it's just the dominant language in the church. And, uh, verse number five. I would that ye all speak with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied. For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. So prophecy is the greater gift, except that, uh, except when the tongues are interpreted, that the church may receive edifying. So tongues only edify the self unless they're interpreted, that the church receives edifying. 
Now it says here, I would that ye all speak with tongues. And I said this before in another video, uh, I would that ye all speak with tongues. Why? Because they can't. They can't all speak with tongues. And uh, I can show you that. Uh, actually, I sort of uh, read it. Uh, 12.10, 1 Corinthians 12.10. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. See, not to all, to another. But it says, I would that you all speak with tongues. And you'll see why he says that. But I'll jump ahead here and just uh, make a good point that what would happen if everyone spoke in tongues? You know, that if everyone could speak in tongues, what would happen? Or, you know, there'd be no need for an interpretation, right? If everyone could speak in tongues, why would you need an interpreter? You wouldn't. You'd understand what they're saying. Because, you know, it says here, you know, the tongues need interpretation to receive edifying. That's because some people don't speak in tongues. If they did, they'd, uh, they wouldn't need an interpretation because they'd know that language also. And already be edified of it, just like prophecy. But these tongues need interpretation. And Acts 2 is very different from 1 Corinthians 14. They are not the same because of the big emphasis in this chapter on interpretation. Keep that in mind. Verse 6. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. Okay, so answer that question. What shall I profit you? You know, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, nothing. It wouldn't profit them nothing unless it's interpreted. Now, if you speak by revelation, knowledge, prophesying, and doctrine, that would profit them because they're not speaking with tongues. You know, they would edify the church that way. He that prophesieth edifieth the church. They're speaking in a known language, the dominant language in the church. So, uh, tongues would profit nothing except it's interpreted. Verses 7 through 11. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. So again, Paul gives an illustration here of instruments, of pipes or harps. You know, there's a distinction in the sounds, there's a distinction in voices, and none of them is without signification, without significance. And I'll just point this out too, that... Uh, who shall prepare himself to the battle? Well, you know, um, it's just it's interesting that you know Paul often uh, references the ministry to um, a sort of battlefield, like in Second Timothy, he compares us to uh, a soldier, where he says, uh, if I can just um, you know where he says to uh, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And in Ephesians 6, you know, of course, that uh, passage where it talks about the uh, whole armor of God. And so the point is, the sound or the tongues need to be understood for battle. That's another reason why Paul would they all why, why Paul says, I would that ye all speak with tongues. That's because if they all spoke in tongues, they would know uh, the meaning of the sounds of the voices. They would know what it means, and they'd be able to prepare, prepare himself to battle. 
there'd be no barrier there. They wouldn't need that interpretation, you know, because some of them do speak in tongues, some of them don't. You know, that's clear here in verse 11. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh the barbarian. That's because not everyone speaks in tongues. If everyone spoke in tongues, they would know the meaning of the voice. So Paul would want them to all speak in tongues so they could prepare themselves to battle without this, um, without the interpretation. So they could just readily understand it and be prepared for battle. You see, that's quite different from Acts chapter 2. There's no interpretation there. It's different, completely different. Because the language, the words we say mean something. You know, and even in uh, verse 11, you know, if, if two speak with tongues, they would understand each other. But, you know, if one speaks in tongues, and if one does not even, you know, they would not understand. They'd need to be... Uh, they'd need to be interpreted for they to understand each other. But if they both spoke with tongues, with the same tongues, they wouldn't need the interpretation. So, verse number 12, Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Here it gives you the whole purpose of having spiritual gifts. What are they for? The edifying of the church. Yeah, verse number 13, Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. Why does he pray to interpret? So that the church may receive edifying. You know, just like he said up here. Verse number 5, That the church may receive edifying. Pray that he may interpret. That the church may receive edifying. Verse 14, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So again, this is just like verse number 2. He does understand what he's saying, but no man understands him. Verse 14, my understanding is unfruitful. He does understand what he's saying, but no one understands him. It's unfruitful. That's what that means. If people could understand what he's saying, it would be fruitful. But he's praying that he can interpret so that it can be fruitful. Because the interpretation gives the understanding. Without the, inter without the interpretation, there's no understanding and it's unfruitful. With the interpretation, there is understanding and it is fruitful and it does edify the church. So the interpretation gives understanding. All right, verse 15. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit. I will sing with the understanding also. Again, you reference this back all the way up to verse 2. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. He understands what he's saying. We've covered that. But others don't unless it's interpreted. And the understand and the interpretation gives the understanding. So what is it then? I will pray with the spirit. I will pray with the understanding also. See, this is praying uh, in your in just it's just the natural language. It's the a natural language that is unknown to others that don't speak that tongue. And I will pray with the understanding also. Well, that would be. Praying with uh, the interpretation. And I'll even jump ahead here to verse 27. If a man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by chorus and that one interpret. So a man could, um, he could be allowed to pray with the church as long as he speaks with an interpretation. So both you know, his kindred, you know, if his family is there, you know, both would uh, have understanding and uh, be edified. You know, same thing with uh, singing with the Spirit. It's uh, in the natural language, but he could pray that he interprets. And, uh, you know, so, but with the church, other kindreds, you know, he should pray, interpret, to sing with understanding with the church. This is a gift of tongues, and you know that could be used for fellowship. Otherwise, the unlearned would say they're mad, just like uh, 
in verse 23, you know, for I'm jumping ahead a little there. In verse 16, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the Lord say amen? And by giving up thanks, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest. So he's blessing with the Spirit, you know, with his prayer and his singing. That's, that's you know, that would be a blessing. And, but how could anyone else say amen, seeing he understandeth not what thou sayest? See, he couldn't. That's why you need the interpretation. If he had interpretation, he could say amen at thy giving of thanks. Because the understanding, or the interpretation gives the understanding. And he could say amen. So you can see how much the emphasis is on interpretation and not the tongues itself. Yeah, even in verse 17, for thou verily givest thanks well, you know, that was a good thing, but the other's not edified. Why not? Because there's no interpretation. If there's interpretation, it gives understanding, it gives edification. So in 1 Corinthians 14, not everyone has tongues, which is why there needs to be interpretation. Verse 18, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than y'all. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So Paul certainly spoke with tongues, absolutely. But he says, yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. I'll just highlight that, because uh, there's a good joke that I can't take credit for. Uh, Brother Brian uh, has a good joke about this in one of his videos. Uh, I can't remember which one, but um, I wrote it down and it was uh, hilarious. Because I get it. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. And the things which thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. So, if you want to teach others also, don't speak in tongues. <laughs> so, get this. The false charismatic tongues are deceptive. They speak babble. You know, they speak two languages here. You know, because I ignorantly went to a charismatic church when I first got saved. And um, I didn't get saved in that place. It was before I went. But I ignorantly started attending there. I didn't know anything about denominations or the gifts or anything like that. But it's an English church. Uh, we all spoke English there. But some of them spoke in tongues. So they spoke two languages. Um, or, well... What I mean by that is they spoke Babel, or gibberish. They spoke two languages. They spoke Babel, and they spoke English. And so, there is no need for them to speak in tongues in the English church. That's what Paul says to do here. You know, get that. He spoke with tongues more than anybody, but in the church, he'd rather speak five words with my understanding, you know, in a language that, um, in the dominant language, in a known tongue than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. And so, you know, a lot of this charismatic movement teaches that everyone can speak in tongues. Everyone should speak in tongues. Anyone and everyone can and should have that gift. And But that's not at all what Paul uh, taught in Romans 12, in 1 Corinthians 12, in uh, chapter 14 here. Because I'll just give you this illustration that, or, um, you know, because when I went to that um, Babel building, I, uh, uh, I'd, I'd hear that all the time, um, them speaking in tongues. There's this one guy, he, he spoke in tongues pretty much every Sunday, but he'd only know um, five, maybe, okay, I'll, I'll just say ten um, words, quote unquote, you know. Uh, you know, it was gibberish, it was just babble, it wasn't words, it wasn't a tongue, really, it was not a language. It was just uh, gibberish. 
but he'd say the same ten words. Um, you know, I'm not going to repeat it because, you know, he could have been, you know, blaspheming God for all I know. So I'm not going to, you know, repeat it. But he'd say the same ten words. And then some guy, someone else, would give the interpretation in English. And so um, next week, next Sunday, he'd, he'd speak in tongues again. The same ten words, you know, he'd say it was the same thing. It was so repetitive. It's the same thing he said last week in his Babelish language. And then that uh, a different guy, uh, the same guy that gave the interpretation the week before, would interpret again, but he'd give a different interpretation. So um, that's very unscriptural. Uh, he, he's saying the same words in this um, quote-unquote tongue, but there's a different interpretation for it every week. But yet, we're an English church. He himself speaks English. He speaks this Babel, he speaks English. But yet, he uh, speaks this Babelish language, and uh, there's an interpretation in English. But we already speak English. Why didn't he just tell us in English? Because that's what Paul says to do here. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding, that by my voice I might teach others also, than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. So, <laughs> it so totally defeats the, the purpose of it. They don't understand the gift of tongues. You know, brethren, be not children in understanding. Be it in, in malice, be ye children, but in understanding, be men. And so, why do they do that? Why do they um, spoke, speak this Babel language and the English language and uh, supposedly... Uh, They'd rather speak in tongues and give an interpretation in English when we already speak English. And um, so, yeah, it's total nonsense. But uh, I believe it's because they think they're speaking mysteries in verse 2 here. Uh, they don't know what this means. You know, when they ever, whenever they see the words in the Spirit, it's speaking in tongues. It's just, you know, you're in the Spirit, you know. Yeah. But that's not all that's not at all what it means um, and so um, about the mysteries what are the mysteries well if you're reading this you know first Corinthians the Corinthians in other words I'll just put it that way if they were reading this letter uh, they would they wouldn't know what this is they would they would know what Paul meant because Paul already told them for one but I'll just point out it's not some uh, weird uh, speaking in tongues thing that you see today. It's not that, oh, they're speaking this babblish language and who knows what they're saying. It's a mystery. You can never find out, but somehow there's this interpretation that's made up from this made up language and it's a mystery. So who knows? That's what, that's not at all what it means. So, uh, what are the mysteries? Well, Paul already told them, uh, Let's go to chapter 2. Um, verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God and a mystery, even the hidden, hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Verse 8. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So, that's what it's referring to. The gospel itself is a mystery. The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for the, his blood atonement for, as the payment for our sins. And so, you know, there's about seven mysteries um, that are revealed throughout the Bible. And one of them is right here. You know, all you have to do is really look up the word mystery and you'll find them. And, uh, so yeah, that's one of the mysteries right there. So Paul told the Corinthians one of the mysteries in chapter 2, then in chapter 4. He says, Let a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So you're to know what the mysteries are. You're, you know, it talks about being a steward of the mysteries. So uh, being a steward is uh, knowing what you have. And uh, again, chapter 14, 
you, you know, speaking mysteries in chapter 15, again, uh, it talks about the gospel, which is a mystery, for had they have known it, they wouldn't have uh, crucified the Lord of glory. And in chapter, or chapter 15, verses, uh, I'll just read 51, Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. It's another mystery. And of course, there's other mysteries as well. You know, the mystery of the, the body of Christ. And, and, you know, of the church. And uh, the indwelling of the, uh, the Holy Spirit. And, you know, some other ones. Uh, mystery of Babylon. Um, in Revelation 17, 18, that's a mystery that the Apostle John revealed about uh, Roman Catholicism. Uh, Rome is mystery of Babylon. And uh, I'm not going to go over all the mysteries, but yeah, that's really all it is. So, um, really, all you really need to understand, or a good, uh, a good thing to understand to, re to refute this whole charismatic tongues is just understanding the interpretation of tongues. And of course, you know, I don't even, I don't even remember saying that, uh, you know, signs are for Jews. I don't think I said that yet, but they are. Um, he told them that, he told the Corinthians that in the same book, 122, 1 Corinthians 122, for the Jews require a sign. Uh, the sign gifts, you know, there are a lot of spiritual gifts, but some of them are sign gifts, and those sign gifts are for the Jews. Uh, he says that in verse 22 here, wherefore tongues are for a sign to them that believe not, you know, uh, Jews, in other words. And again, I'll, I'll probably... Uh, I would like to do verses 21 through 40. I'm not going to get into it right now. But, uh, you know, other than that, just understand the interpretation. I think uh, verse 19 is really the key here. Um, there's no reason for, you know, a church building that, that everyone that goes there speaks English and for someone to speak in this Babelish language who also speaks English to... Um, to start speaking in tongues, quote unquote, and then give an interpretation in English when they already speak English. Why did they? Why didn't they just tell them in English? Uh, cause they speak, cause they think they're speaking mysteries. I guess that's all I can really think of, but they don't even know what the mysteries are. And um, you know, just go to chapter two again. You know, talking about the spirit. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of a man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit, which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And uh, it goes on there, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And um, maybe I can even run to uh, Romans real quick, where it talks about Um, the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And, you know, uh, verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also help with our infirmities. We know not what the, we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. See, so again, the whole Charismatics will uh, use this verse. And uh, that's not talking about tongues at all in this uh, verse at all um, it's just saying that the spirit the holy ghost the holy spirit intercedes for us because uh, we know not what we should pray for as we ought and i confess that as well you know uh, i know not what i should pray for as i ought to you know and so uh it's a beautiful verse here that's very uh you know, comforting to know that, that the uh, Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Um, without words, in other words, it's not um, an audible um, language or anything. It's not tongues that this charismatic um, thing does. And uh, so, yeah, this verse is uh, really uh, amazing. It's a very interesting verse. And... Um, you know, with that in mind, uh, you know, I'm pretty confident that it's uh, speaking mysteries as well. So uh, that'll be it uh, for uh, this study here. 
And so any questions, comments, or criticisms are welcome. And uh, that'll be it. I suppose this was sort of a long video. But I uh, hope you enjoyed that. And uh, thank you for your time and patience. God bless.